behalf of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, I'm happy to welcome you to this morning's lecture. I'm Brian Cannon, I direct the, the center. And the center's mission is to promote the study of the American West. We'll ask our office specialist, Amy Carlin, to offer an opening prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here, gathered here today as students, faculty, and staff at this beautiful university. We are grateful that Dr. Vega is able to join us and to give her presentation. We ask that thou will bless her during, during this lecture and also bless us that we may be receptive and open to what she has to say and that we may learn and be edified. We love thee and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We turn the time now to my colleague Ignacio Garcia to introduce today's speaker. Oh, this works now. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Brian. And uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce someone who I just uh, recently met at a conference uh, and had an opportunity to go to lunch and to talk about her work and, and her perceptions of us as a as a religious community, and I can say that I, I was very impressed, and I think uh, she's going to be a wonderful, uh, she is a fine scholar, she's going to be a, a great contributor to both Latino and Mormon studies, and, and so it's really a, a pleasure to have her here with us. <coughs> Professor Sujay Vega is a graduate of the University of North Texas, where she received her bachelor's in anthropology and then went on to the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, where she received both her master's and her doctorate in anthropology. She's currently an assistant professor of women and gender studies at the School of Social Transformation and an affiliate faculty of the School of Transporter Studies and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Dr. Vega's research focus explores the everyday living experiences of Latinos and Latinas in the United States and traces the way they create their own notion of home and community, including in places where we don't normally consider Latino spaces. Her book, Latino Heartland, A Borders and Belonging in the Midwest, and I just started reading this, it's a fascinating book, uh, uh, looks at Latino and Latin Latinos in Indiana, uh, coming to terms with living in the same communal space despite their differences and in spite of Uh, the immigration crisis and debate that has been raging for the last sort of, well, I guess forever when it comes to our community. But the book focuses on ethnic religious practices, comadrazgo or female social networks, ethnic solidarity and community organizations that help Mexicans find their communal space in a Midwestern city. It is particularly relevant today when the immigration debate has heated up and called into question the spaces that Mexicans and Latinos, including those who are Latter-day Saints, occupy in this nation. Dr. Vega's current uh, project looks at Latino LDS members in the Phoenix area and the role of the LDS Church, particularly the Relief Society, plays in the lives of, those, of these individuals. Her lecture today provides us some thoughts on why Latinos and Latinas are attracted to the LDS Church in such high numbers and how these individuals explore their faith gain leadership, and form ethnic solidarity within this religious space. Moreover, moreover, it seeks to help us understand how immigrant immigration politics infiltrates places of worship today and sometimes creates division when it should not. Now, this may be done more in her lecture tomorrow at Women's Studies, but I sort of wanted to preempt that a little bit. At a time when the LDS Church is becoming a church of color demographically, the timing of this discussion could not be be any better, and I'm sure we will come out of this lecture better informed and hopefully more committed to helping us resolve issues that come with our differences in nationality, ethnicity, race, gender, as well as other characteristics that are part of human nature. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sujay Bell. Thank you, Ignacio, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Brian Cannon and the Red Center for Western Studies for having me out here um, and inviting me to speak. 
Also, thank you to Amy Carlin for helping coordinate this visit, and certainly muchísimas gracias to my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Ignacio Garcia. I'm trying to go back on my presentation here. Here we go. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, as Dr. Garcia mentioned, I am doing research on what I'm calling the desert diaspora. Um, and partly this is due, obviously, the desert part um, to the notion of um, LDS populations within uh, expanding right, notions of identity. Um, so that the desert isn't just lo located in Salt Lake City, um, but can be thought of as a diaspora, right? Involving other global environments and other global participants into the church. Um, and in particular, I'm looking at ethnic belonging, and I'll kind of touch on that in a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, but I'm looking at the way that uh, Latino LDS members are creating a sense of belonging in their church, right? And sometimes what are the barriers, and what are the things that they're doing to overcome those barriers? So I'll start off with a narrative, because um, I'm an ethnographer, I'm a historian, but I'm also an ethnographer, so I do interviews. So here is... Um, uh, an interview, uh, the Spanish is on top, the English is on the bottom, and I'll go ahead and read this English. I told my kids that we got to see a lot of places. We went on an airplane to Mexico City, to Monterrey, to Sonora, Juarez. It was a terrible adventure, but I tried to make it fun for them, as if everything was okay. But mom, they would say, but son, do you want to see your father? Yes. Well, then don't worry. Everything will be all right as long as you're with me. Thank God we're here, because whatever he, uh, we went through, it was because, of, because he wanted us to value everything we have now, our home, our family. So Veronica courageously faced the crossing with her children. She crossed the border um, undocumented. And though she was terrified, she referenced the crossing as una aventura, an adventure to compartmentalize the fear and transform it into an excitement for her children. In the end, religion became Veronica's own way to compartmentalize and deal with her reality. It was women like Veronica who solidified my own interest in faith as a coping mechanism for Latino immigrants. In 2003, while conducting ethnographic research on Chicago's historic Mexican neighborhoods, I witnessed the national tour of the Tilma de Tepeyac, religious relic, a 17th century statue of the Virgin of Guadalupe carrying a glass encased piece of the tilma, or the cape, worn by Juan Diego. The relic visited Our Lady of Tepeyac Parish in the little village neighborhood of Chicago while I was in the field or collecting research. Just a few miles from where I lived, hundreds of Mexican Catholics gathered, knelt, knelt down at the pews, and prayed. As I observed their prayer, I could not help but feel moved, moved not by the presence of the relic, but by the power of faith. Watching young and old, women and men, pray, pray together solidified my commitment to understand how faith is woven within the fabric of everyday life for Latinos. Here my analysis of faith is not about theology or holy scriptures, though those are very important to folks that participate in these realms. Instead, I focus on the lived religion, what Ada Maria Isasi Diaz noted as lo cotidiano, the quotidian, or the everyday ways that faith is lived, utilized, and changed by its followers. For instance, Latino immigrants I've spoken to, like Veronica, face life or death situations, worry about feeding their children, fear being deported, and confront people who buy into hostility that politicians inflame yearly. And unfortunately, you see that happening now. Faith for these folks is, yes, deeply sacred, but it also provides material and emotional stability in an otherwise unstable and terrifying world. <clears throat> this emphasis on Latino faith experiences comes out of an interest developed while writing and researching for my first book, which Dr. Garcia mentioned, Latino Heartland. <coughs> where I developed the concept of ethnic belonging to explore organic moments of ethnic solidarity and ethnic identity that precede community organizations or public protest. Take some water here. Okay. 
Though not as visible as civic participation, civic activism, or ethnic, ethnic belonging points to those beginning steps necessary for claiming Renato Rosaldo mentioned as a right to be different and to belong. My emphasis on ethnic belonging locates more intimate instances that affirm one's ethnic right to belong. Thus, faith-based networks can become critical venues for communicating notions of belonging, developing self-confidence, providing deeper meaning to life, celebrate ethnic cultural identity, and alleviate the sorrows of the immigrant experience. For Latinos that I've studied, leadership roles in Bible study sessions and opportunities to hear and bear witness to the trauma of border crossings help followers locate their voice and cultivate the fuerza, or strength, to confront personal and structural adversity, all while maintaining a rich, decidedly ethnic cultural identity. I began with Veronica's narrative because she led me to this work on LDS Latinos. I met Veronica with a group of five other women in 2006 at their storefront rama, or branch, where close to a dozen families gathered every Sunday for worship and fellowship with each other. Prior to 2006, I had never met a Latino LDS member. And to be frank, I didn't even know such a community existed. The members of this branch helped grow my appreciation for this unique Latino experience. For instance, even though Mago, another participant, had only been in the United States for six month, months, she had already expressed an immense gratitude to the Women of Relief Society. When I asked her how the Mormon Church and the Relief Society factored into her life, she explained that it was un cariño y humanidad, an affection and a sisterhood. It is a mutual support we give one another. It teaches us to listen, to understand, and help each other. These church networks offered women spiritual, material, and social support. The frequent gatherings and legitimate concern for one another allowed them to pull their emotional and financial resources together to help out an hermana and her family when she most needed it. For many, the church provides familial networks that were otherwise severed due to distance, or family feuds. Women who lacked family networks in the area explained how the deep friendship within their Mormon branch sustained them through bouts of loneliness. As Fas revealed to another participant, even when I was in my country, without the church, I felt lonely. Now I know that I'm not alone because I know I have hermanos who in good times and in bad times we are together. When I asked Fas how her life is different now that she's a Mormon, she responded, quote, my life has changed very much. It was hard to have unity in the family. My son didn't know his father for 10 years, and this is partly because he was here in the States and she was in Mexico. But we pray together. Three months ago, we were talking about divorce. Being in the church has helped us. <clears throat> Members of the church helped her emotionally and financially, finding her family a comfortable home to rent, and a Latino realtor from the church worked within their budget to locate a home for them to purchase without charging them realtor fees. Like Bas, I found myself in need of uh, relocation help when my husband, six-year-old son, and I moved to Phoenix in 2011. We moved to Arizona a year after the infamous SB 1070 was signed into law. As a daughter of once undocumented immigrants myself and a scholar of immigration studies, I was apprehensive of entering the metaphorical belly of the beast. What I did not know at the time was that there was already an active campaign to recall Russell Pierce, the author of Arizona's infamous 1070. Importantly, Pierce is an LDS member and even suggested that he had the backing of the Mormon church for his politics. <coughs> In reality, his actions opened up a wound within the LDS community that is yet to fully heal. From one day to the next, long-time immigrant members and leaders of the church packed their trucks and left Arizona. Wards, whose membership once outgrew their worship spaces, struggled to survive years later. Charismatic Latina and Latino leaders whose commitment to their faith shined through their callings struggled to find work after SB 1070. People's souls were full, but their pockets empty. Years after 1070, LDS members still recalled the anger and despair caused by Esa Pierce y Arpaio. 
El Latina and Mesa would not wait for Mormon headquarters to respond. In her 60s at the time of our interview, Patti grew incensed at the stories from other Latino sisters and brothers from a ward within the same space as many of Pierce's supporters. These Latino members felt inundated with subtle and overt messages that they were not welcome there. During a visit by white elders to Patti's ward, she could not help herself. During a casual conversation with elders, Patti made sure to bring up the feelings of her fellow Spanish-speaking brethren in other wards. I asked if she felt at all intimidated or if it was okay to bring up these internal politics when white and Latino members were in conflict. And Patti responded, I couldn't stay silent. Indeed, unwilling to be muted, Patti critiqued the presence of political flyers within the walls of her meeting house. She demanded that the pro Pierce flyers be taken down. And as she remembered during our interview, they were leaving propaganda in our ward. And I said, what's going on? Then I started to read it. And I thought, oh no, this is not right at all. Pat Patti did not appreciate the uncomfortable blending of church and state in this issue and stood up to church elders. By demanding that the flyers be removed, Patti showcased her right to speak up and change things she felt were not right in her ward. She showcased incredible leadership and courage that caused change, if only locally, in the way political flyers could be displayed amongst members. I began research in the Latino Mormon population precisely because of my experience in Indiana. I knew LDS Latinos who were immigrants, some undocumented. And I wondered how Spanish-speaking wards in Arizona were dealing with Pierce's rhetoric. Now considered the fastest growing community within the LDS church, I wondered how the Latino LDS members were being received or rejected by other members of their faith, especially those who attended the same meeting house as Pierce himself. Faced with this politics of belonging within the walls of their church as well as within the state of Arizona, how were Latino Mormons coping with their marginal status within national and religious imaginaries? Did faith soothe or aggravate the precarity of Spanish-speaking members? Importantly, notions of migration, movement, and fleeing all come to define the formation of Mesa, Arizona. Searching for a space to expand the desert and locate a possible refuge site for polygamous LDS families, Brigham Young had said himself that the move south served to, quote, grow the gospel to Lehi's millions of Mexican descendants. These white LDS families created a pioneer village amongst the Zahona Odom in 1877 and expanded the desert diaspora to the Phoenix area. By 1918, LDS members in the Salt River Valley included a small but thriving Spanish chapel. Assisted by Mexican, the Mexican mission, this chapel grew steadily and actually predates the now infamous Lucero Ward here in Salt Lake City. Together, white indigenous and Spanish-speaking saints created the now thriving city of Mesa, Arizona. However, by 2010, Latino members battled two fronts of belonging, that of the nation state and that, that of their faith group. Caught between staunch conservative members like Pierce and their efforts to welcome Spanish-speaking converts, the Church of Latter-day Saints finally, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, finally released an official statement in June 2011, a full year after SB 1070 was passed. The statement utilized the Church's own history of expulsion and persecution to draw parallels with the documented families. The history of mass expulsion or mistreatment of individuals or families is cause for concern, especially where race, culture, or religion are involved. This should give pause to any policy that contemplates targeting any one group, particularly if that group comes mostly from one heritage. This church statement, the Utah Compact that preceded it, and the countless efforts of Latinos and non-Latino members to promote a more compassionate approach toward immigration all provided an alternative narrative to Pierce. Now recalled, thankfully, and released from his post, interviews with LDS members in 2014 only spoke about Pierce as a chapter closed, an uncomfortable moment, but one that had passed. To a non-member, such as myself, a narrator, I'm sorry, the narrative clearly reiterated the cohesiveness of the church, much like the family unit these fissures were obviously not to be discussed in public. 
In truth, I've only just begun to establish myself with the community. So it may take some time for people to open up completely about this contentious moment. Church and politics are almost always forbidden from polite conversation, and here I am asking people to ask about it, to talk about both. Using the family as a model for understanding the church is useful for multiple reasons. Now, the least of which is the church's emphasis on the family <clears throat> as a unifying thing for faith. From President Hinckley's famed 1995 proclamation on the family, the LDS family is both an institutional and embodied model for its members. Moreover, the Book of Mormon introduces readers to the commonplace family dynamic of sibling rivalry. Unwilling to respect the teachings of their brother Nephi, Laman and Lemuel continuously question, defy, and even plot to kill their prophetic little brother. As once lost and then found, Latinos, as descendants of Laman, are framed as the prodigal sons and daughters welcomed back into God's glory. And as part of that celebratory return, Latino members receive benefits, like services in Spanish and cultural events, benefits that folks like Russell Pierce might object to because they don't promote complete assimilation, or what I call ethnic annihilation. Importantly, Mesa presents a critical space for this kind of inquiry. As a cradle for early Latino Mormon participants in the, in the Lamanite temple, or what Mesa's temples was often referred to, Mesa's Latino LDS population had an important past within the faith, a history that Russell Pierce casually omitted in his rhetoric. The Mesa Temple was coined the Lamanite Temple and provided ordinances to the increasing Latino converts. Indeed, the Mesa Temple was the first ever to offer endowments in a language other than English, and this was in Spanish. This signals the importance of the Mesa LDS community as a destination for Latino LDS members who had nowhere else to go for rituals critical to the faith. For years, Mesa hosted annual Spanish-speaking Lamanite conferences that brought together families and youth from throughout the Southwest, the Lamanite conferences were lovingly, lovingly remembered by Mesa's Latino saints as a time to rejoice in the presence of other LDS Latinos. Beyond temple work, the Lamanite conferences included dances, dinners, and in some cases, courting between Latino LDS members. I, I met a few couples who met each other at these conferences. These conferences in the Mesa temple itself were critical for laying the foundation for attracting Latinos to the faith. Importantly, being tied to laymen is not necessarily always celebrated by Latino Mormons. Some members I've spoken to grimace the identifier because of how they might be read, imagined, or treated by white members as somehow less suitable for grace or second-class converts. For instance, in being identified as Lamanites or being part of the tribe of Manasea, uh, Latinos feel they are being imagined as something other than mainstream LDS and as descendants of laymen might be subconsciously viewed through a history of violence, rebellion, or worse as novice to the faith. Indeed, though I have heard from many white LDS members who appreciate the culture and the commitment to family that Latinos exhibit, it is rare to hear about the intellect, the leadership, the scriptural knowledge of their Spanish-speaking brethren. But while there is critique of the Lamanite la label, there is also embrace. There are Spanish-speaking members who just as easily identify with their term, with this term, and see it as their place of honor within the Book of Mormon. For instance, LDS Bishop and Utah University professor, Dr. Orlando Rivera, utilized this Lamanite narrative to tie to Chicano nationalism in a 1978 essay. We ourselves, we are ourselves Chicanos, and all Chicanos think of themselves as having an Indo-Hispanic background, of having ancestral roots native to America as well as to Europe. Thus, you considering us Lamanites is no way offensive, but rather acceptable to our people. We are proud of our Native American progenitors. And here I just want to kind of do a shout out that if you want to know more about the Chicano um, Mormon connection or Chicano Mormon identities, Please see Chicano while Mormon by Dr. Ignacio Garcia. For Rivera, claims to a Lamanite past could be highlighted when speaking to a Chicano community that recognized indigenous heritage as a positive. Rivera goes on to inform his Mormon audience about the internal colonialism model to explain the exploitive relationship between Anglos and Latinos in the United States. He suggests that Mormons can begin the process of healing 
But in order to do so, they must be cognizant of, quote, the barriers that inhibit such a bridging. Rivera critiques the expectations by white Mormons who assume their Latino brethren will assimilate and laments the closing of Spanish-speaking wards. Following his clear framing within Chicano nationalism, Rivera asserts the need for self-determination amongst the growing Latino LDS community. Quote, we must have an opportunity to plan for and administer and do things in our own way, for our own selves, completely and independently. When I asked Arizona Mormons about the Lamanite narrative, there were varied responses from outright laughter of, remember when they used to call us Lamanites? And they kind of both chattered together. To, yeah, we're Lamanites. It's a story of the Americas, and it's important. It's our place in the Book of Mormon. Similarly, Utah Spanish-speaking members said, it is us, our story, our people. And yeah, it's meaningful. It's our history. However, as one member of Carlos informed me, the emphasis on the Lamanite narrative was de-emphasized not too long ago. As Carlos himself noted, quote, they didn't even ask the Lamanites themselves if they wanted to de-emphasize the story. Perhaps as a result of the historical criticism, perhaps related to the Human Genome Project, perhaps because LDS missioning was moving toward other non-Lamanite sites. I may never know exactly why the Lamanite narrative has been muted, but it certainly has. This policy change created a hueco, or a gap, that needed to be filled. So in 2004, the church headquarters church headquarter sponsored the Luz de las Naciones uh, celebration at the conference center and marked a change from local small-scale Latino celebrations to large-scale production quality performances. Wards like the Lucero Ward in Salt Lake City or the Leojona Wards in Arizona always celebrated their ethnic traditions during multiple events throughout the year. But in 2004, these events could also be produced at a large scale. This marks a critical moment for the church, for it showcases not just that they are aware of their Latino members, but are welcoming them in official celebrations. As I tell my students all the time, there is a difference between tolerating people and accepting them. These celebrations seem to move toward acceptance, as both Latino and white members come together to perform and embrace the Latino influence on Temple Square. In December 2014, I attended Vena Mi Casa, which is featured here, and was stunned at the quality of talent, costumes, and dances featured. According to Elder Russell Ballard, these events were created to, quote, get together as brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors. Thus, the model of the church as a family remains, brothers, sisters, friends, and neighbors. Importantly, we must avoid overly romantic visions of belonging and family, for we know that the church can be incredibly welcoming to some while inhospitable to others, like the LGBT community. Still, many Latinos do find home and belonging in these spaces and appreciate the celebrations as gestures of embrace that feed their cultural and spiritual families. The last celebration was a festive folkloric potpourri of pan-Latino music that showcased Christmas celebrations across Latin America. This was a cultural ethnic celebration that was grounded in Christmas traditions. As the program or the promotion video reveals, and here I'm gonna show you a few clips from the video, it's mostly in Spanish, but I'll kind of go through a few of the, of the scenes with you in English um, afterwards. Siento que es una manera de predicar el Evangelio. 
también puedes compartir a través de la música, el espíritu de la Navidad y también fue muy bonito poder aprender sobre a las tradiciones de otros países. Sí, me gusta mucho, una buena experiencia. Y pienso que esta nueva generación es bueno que puedan ver lo hermoso que es el mundo latino. The Pan Latino music is festive, and constant response of El Espíritu would lead us to believe that the events were highly religious. But for me, as a non member, the celebrations were equally rich with ethnic identity. The songs, the music, the public display of ethnic belonging all tug at the nostalgic heart and showcase to the next generation the beauty in their cultural heritage. Lineage and heritage matters throughout the church. But whereas white Mormons often place themselves in what I'm calling the lineage bingo, you know, when you trace your family to the original settlers or well-known members of the church, you know, people can trace their lineage, Latinos don't have that privilege. Thus, these celebrations become a great way to showcase other forms of pride in genealogy and cultural identity. I spoke to performers and asked them why this was so important to them, why they participated and gave up hours of their lives to the volunteer. Right? One performer said, it's, a very, it's very nice because you offer up your talent, you share it with people, and especially because it's something very traditional, you feel it closer in your hearts, especially now that one is so far from your homeland. Performer Sue said, for me it was very important that our children know all of this. This is one way, in a much smaller scale, of course, that they know they will have exposure to what we lived as we lived as children. And performer three, I think these events have many purposes. Not only the showcase of our talents and our culture and our roots, but also the opportunity to meet people and create many friendships and relationships that otherwise would not we would not have had the chance to. These answers spoke to the faith-based ethnic belonging the right to be different and belong in religious spaces. These Latino saints are claiming their own way to belong and draw strength from their church. The question remains, however, how the next generation will carry this forward. In Arizona, at least, there are tremendous pressures to assimilate and lose one's language and ethnic identity. Certainly, individuals like Russell Pierce do not help. Additionally, Tucson's ethnic studies ban also falsely describes positive learning of ethnic identity as a dangerous program that, quote, promotes the overthrow of the government 
and promotes resentment toward race or class of people. Thus, in Arizona, Latino youth are being denied the opportunity to learn about their past and celebrate their ethnic present. As a Latina living in Arizona myself, I felt incredibly moved during the Latino Christmas celebration, as I was brought to tears remembering my own abuelita saying, Os pido posada, and knowing that for many, posada, or shelter, goes denied by immigration politics. Though this talk was inclusive of Latino voices from Arizona, Utah, and Indiana, my emphasis going forward is on research in Arizona and Mesa in particular. Mesa Spanish-speaking LDS members hold significant historical and contemporary meaning. Mesa provided the first temple space for so many Spanish-speaking saints for decades, but it was also the site of contemporary battles led by Russell Pierce and his followers. My son and I have started reading Harry Potter, this is an aside, and he asked me the other night, Mom, what is the phoenix? I explained that it's a mythical feature, creature that rises from the ashes after something is burned. I said that's why we're, we live in a city called Phoenix, because it feels so hot during the summers that it's a miracle people even live here or rise from the ashes. In reality, I wonder if Arizona and Mesa itself will be able to rise from the ashes of immigration politics. Will the return to being a place where Brigham Young sent many a hopeful families to begin anew and bring the gospel to the descendants of Laman? I hope by bringing attention to the history and vibrancy of present-day Latino LDS members in Russell Pierce's own district to Mesa, that Mesa can rise from the ashes of its smoldering anti-immigrant past. I want to end by quickly promoting that if you are at all interested in more Mexican Mormon history, there's a museum here in Provo called the Museum of Mormon History in Mexico that provides amazing information about this past, um, has original documents, and has rich history. So thank you all for having me, and I, and I hope that this is somewhat informational. <laughs>